to what extent do you feel like this is about confronting, you know, what we understand to be masculinity? You know, as far as well, not being able to engage uh, with mental yeah, health. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All the guys you're talking about are mm. big, powerful, masculine guys. Right. How do you think about masculinity in all of this? Think about the opposites of my life. So I've trained, Randy Couture and I started a mixed martial arts cross training program for pro athletes in 2007. We've trained uh, hundreds of thousands of pro athletes and other people like, man, so many people. Our whole unbreakable way that we fight in there is we are, again, relentless, relentless, relentless. But if I am hurt or tired, you will never, ever know. Our fighters, our players, don't put your hands on your hips. Don't show anyone. Because the moment I see you, hands, you have your hands on your hips, I'm like, oh, you're starting to break. And I forget I'm getting tired because I start getting all excited that you're getting tired. And that's when I sharpen my weapons. I tell our guys, <laughs> no stool, no, don't show it. We don't show it. If I'm hurt, you will never, ever, ever, ever know. And now I'm sure trying to preach the exact opposite. The exact opposite. When it comes to life, show it, tell it, let's see it so we can all have a fight team together. So, but again, that's part of that masculinity that we were always ingrained and taught as little kids on is no, you don't show it, you suck it up, you pull your bootstraps up and that's great for sports. It is great for sports. Absolutely great for sports. It's terrible for the rest of our lives. It is, it's sort of like a warrior code. It's yes. like, okay, yeah. you're going on the battlefield. Uh, you might not survive, but survival is not the point. Victory is the point, mm -hmm. right? So, I mean. Or even victory of like, you go down, you die on your shield. Absolutely. Where I really started opening up about issues was in a cage with Randy Couture and Chuck Liddell. And we'd be in there after we would train and we'd be crying to each other. And people would walk past and be like, wow, these guys really beat the hell out of each other. <laughs> <laughs> they were crying because <laughs> the beatings, but it wasn't. It was the stuff that we were talking about. We opened up to each other at those moments. And that's when um, man, I really realized that's true masculinity. This is this vulnerability. This is the strongest thing we're doing. How do you think about courage in that, in that way? Like, what does courage mean for you? Because I feel like that's very courageous a to open up. Very courageous. Again, I never told Strahan until last a year and a half ago. It's very courageous because our brain tends to make up storylines and finish the story for us. And often those stories just aren't true. That's a lot. The brain's the most powerful weapon in the world. And it could be used to make all our dreams come true, but it could really be used also to hurt ourselves. And for you to be able to stand up to your own, I say the roommates in my head, to stand up to them, that's really courageous. And to find other ways and other answers. And, and a lot of it too, again, I'm 53. So for 51 years, I had a certain way of thinking. And now I'm just learning a, a better way to think. You know, one of the things that's in, in your book and uh, is ways of, it's throughout it, is ways of succeeding. What's your advice for people yeah. about how to power through and, and build success for themselves? Well, first, don't power through. That's, that's one thing, don't power through. And the pain that you're in, it's real. Like some of the things I do now, look, I talk about building a team, having a team, finding that team. Yeah. Right? And your team, and, and I've had a lot of people go, I have no teams. We all have teams. I choose to have faith. God's a team for me. And I don't ask God to make me rich or get me a job. I just, hey, I want you to be my best friend, parent. What's your best friend and parent do for you? They listen. That's all I want. I'm not asking for anything else. And I would actually, in those 11 years of making the 9,700 bucks a year, um, I would, Every week, I'd say, God, just, I don't need you to get me this job. Just, I get knocked down, pick me up, brush me off, and let's keep walking this walk together. Yeah. There's power in numbers. I got a rescue pit who just passed, but she's my team. My son is my team. My fight team is my team. My Fox and Apple Sunday team is my team. Groups of friends are my teams. We do have teams that are out there for us. When you have these mental health issues, a lot of time you're self-loathing. You don't want to believe that anybody loves you or anybody likes you or you have these teams. We do have these teams, so I lean into these teams. And listen, the first time I did it, I went down to the Tampa Super Bowl and I was going through it, and I called Rondé Barber and three other friends of ours in our little group down there. And Rondé's been one of my closest friends. I said, hey, I land today, um, I need to link up with you guys for dinner tonight. And they all told me they had other plans. And I said, no, I'm struggling, I need to meet for dinner tonight. And all four guys said, we're there. They canceled plans. And we're there, two of them said, man, 
I go through it too. I'm struggling too. So bam, now all of a sudden we have a little support group that we could talk to there. And me and one of the guys, Ben, we constantly are, are keeping up on each other. So you have these teams you can lean in, in on. And the other thing that people think is people don't want to hear negativity. Like, or you just want to hear, oh, not again. It's never happened to me. Every single time I've called some, again, I've been talking to Whit about this, Andrew Whitworth, for a while, and he today, I'll be there in four hours. Bam. People want to be there for you. Because another thing in my book here is being of service. And that's what we could do, being of service, listening to other people, hearing people out, being there for other people is a way to be of service. I lift several things in the books to be of service because that really gets me through my darkest times. But some of them involve money, a lot of them don't. There's a great story um, about you and Strahan making Christmas special. You want to share that with our audience? Uh, no, no, it was me and T. Here's yeah. what I did. Again, what, what did you do for Christmas? There, there's, there's ways that I knew we could, I could be of service. I think I just got the job at CBS, so that was for 50 grand, by the way. And so I went to the um, post office in New York, the zip code 10001. And when kids send letters to Santa, it goes there. But they actually divide them up. And you can go in, and I would get these letters from these oh, kids. Oh, they'll, they'll give you the, they'll give the, you the letters. Christmas letters, yeah, yeah. the Santa letters. letters. It sounds like that would be like a federal crime or something, but not, not if it's to Santa. Okay. So, um, <laughs> listen, Santa's breaking into people's houses anyway through the chimney, so it's yeah, breaking right. and entering. Yeah. I'm Jewish, so I'm like, what's wrong with you people? You let this guy break and enter in your house? And I would go there, get these letters, and, and they'd, a lot of them were really heartbreaking. They just want pants with no holes for the night. They don't get made fun of, or a blanket, or, or a lot of them are heartbreaking. And I would actually go, and I would fulfill, started with like three of these letters, and then I took my fight team, and because some of these are really bad areas, I, would, I couldn't go myself. And we went in there, and I would knock on these doors, and I would say, hey, did you, is there a such and such here? Well, Santa sent us, we got your letter. And, oh man, talk about, there's no way to be in the gray when you do something like that. Well, eventually as people started hearing what I was doing, they all wanted to start doing it. So I started getting more and more and more letters and started giving them out to different friends and people who had restaurants and this and that, and it started becoming a thing. And then it went back, Tiki would come with me. So all of a sudden you get the start and running back to the Giants and he's showing up. Yeah, like, that's pretty awesome. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Did you ever don the Santa Claus outfit? No, 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 no. Not never even like, that. not never even an elf hat? No, 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 that, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> mm. But there's ways, like oh, so. It's like yeah. But it, like Santa my son sent and I, a bouncer to bring you. Santa, right, exactly. <laughs> a lot of bouncers. But all these guys too were like, "You're doing what? We're in." But listen, social media makes us think we're bad these days, and that our lives suck, and people bully us so much. But people want to do good. People are inherently good. Yeah. We're just forgetting that because we're so wrapped up in what we're seeing over here. But we're inherently good. And you know, another quick thing I do with my son again for people. You don't have to have a ton of money to do this. My son and I would go to the 99 cent store and we'd get toothbrush, toothpaste, handy wipes, deodorant, uh, socks, hand sanitizer, soap, and like pen and pen. And we'd put them together and hand them out to the homeless. It's eight bucks, cost eight dollars, that's it. Hand them out to the homeless. And I wanted to teach my son this. So there's ways we could be of service, but the gray does not have any room in my head in those days and usually a couple days after. So being of service really lifts us up. And then like, listen, volunteer for a charity. I, when I'm having my really bad gray days, I call four friends to tell them that I'm struggling, but then I call four other people just to check up on them without telling them I'm struggling. And that's my way of being of service. And especially in today's day and age, usually three out of four, but often four out of four going, no, it's funny that you called. You know, I'm right. dealing with this or I'm dealing with that, I'm dealing with this, and it lifts us up. Tell me about Logan. You were talking about service. I started a charity a while ago. Uh, and again, here's another way you could be of service is whatever you do for a living or whatever your strengths are, figure out where that can help. So for me, I'm in football. And I would find kids who are really fighting for their lives, similar to what Make-A-Wish does, but I would try and make it a little more long-term. So one year, um, there's this kid, Logan Nabriga, uh, who was at UCLA Children's Hospital. and he got reached out, it was pretty funny, got reached out through a friend of mine um, who was working at UCLA Children's Hospital and hit her, 
uh, significant other, Rick Jaffe, was one of the people who hired me at Fox, and said, hey, this kid Logan's a huge fan of yours. So instead of a sports team, we really want, he wants you, and he wants you to visit him at UCLA Children's Hospital. I said, great. Came in there, I had all these gifts for him. I walked in there, and he looked at me, and he's like, who's this guy? <laughs> They totally lied to me just to get somebody there. <laughs> that's that's great. <laughs> but Logan and I, man, he became my dude. We, man, we connected. How did you uh, handle yourself in that moment? He's like, oh, I laughed. I'm just I... normally me. I'm just like, all right, well, here who I am, kid. Thanks everybody for setting me up on this. And, and he's um, like, okay, you're yeah. not, yeah, all right. We really, really, really connected. The point where, like, I wanted to know his grades, his report card, all this. And his first, when he got a stent out. So what was he? What was he suffering from? Okay. Leukemia. Okay. Uh, two stints. I met him in his first, second time. He went back in. Him and his mom, Kersha, became like the welcoming committee there at UCLA Children's Hospital because they knew where they're going already. Um, just incredible people. And when he got a stent taken out, I had him come to the gym, and we had a surprise party with all these NFL players there. Um, he showed up for his last chemo radiation treatment with a Gronk jersey. And I called Gronk, and I'm like, any way you're in town? He's like, I actually am. I'm like, dude, here's the deal. Yeah. Gronk shot right over to the gym, unbreakable, bam. And I called Logan, I'm like, where you at? And he's like, oh, I'm down here. I was like, dude, you need to get to the gym now. And his mom was like, oh, I, you didn't show Jay your report card. And he walks in and there's Gronk, and he sees him, and he goes, we're like, hey. And he's like, wait, so I'm not in trouble? We're like, no, this sucks. <laughs> he's slipping his report card back behind his back. <laughs> yeah, and um, his first trip, I actually took him to the Pro Bowl with my son. Um, and Andy Reid was the coach there. So took, he took him on the cart and drove him out and did everything. And that was my dude, man. Logan's my dude. And now he is cancer-free, leukemia-free, amazing. If you enjoyed this clip, we've got more where that came from. Be sure to check out my full conversation with Jay Glazer. And one of the best ways you can help support us is to subscribe to the channel so you won't miss our interviews and short videos as they come out each week.